A year goes by since the murder and escape from Rome. The Neapolitans can't get enough of him. Caravaggio is doing great work, and guess what? No fights. So why does he suddenly leave and end up in Malta, of all places? Not to be a crusader against the Turks, that's for sure. But there was one thing that Malta, the Christian island in the Muslim Mediterranean, could give him, which Naples couldn't. Status. Respect. A knighthood. One of his patrons makes the right noises and introduces Caravaggio to the Holy Order of the Knights of St. John one of the most rich and powerful organizations in Europe. Becoming a knight would mean not only honor and respect, but also a chance to wipe the bloody slate of his past clean. Now, normally being a convicted murderer would be an insurmountable obstacle to admission. Not for Caravaggio. On the 14th of July, 1608, the robe with the Maltese cross is put around the fugitive's shoulders and he is officially proclaimed one of the greatest of painters, living or dead. In exchange for all this, Caravaggio undertook a painting for the Knights Cathedral. You have to imagine this place filled with robes and incense and echoing with deep, dark anthems. The beheading of John the Baptist is the biggest thing Caravaggio had ever done. 17 feet long, filling the entire eastern wall of the oratory. It's movie screen sized. He wanted the knights to feel it, not as a painting, but as a living drama going on right in front of them. No wonder it sends a shiver through us, this thing, this infamous butchery, taking place in a grim prison yard where the body of John the Baptist has been dragged to have his head hacked off. It's a scene of remorseless cruelty that tears your insides out and turns art upside down. Art is supposed to bring us beauty, but just look at that semicircle of figures and you will see something has gone terribly wrong. That perfect lily white arm carries the golden bowl into which the Baptist's head will drop. The solemn soldier, the embodiment of authority, is giving the order for an atrocity. And that perfect nude is a cold-blooded hitman with a knife. The action seems to go on forever, until, like that anguished old woman, all you can do is scream. Caravaggio gives us death twice over the death of John the Baptist and the death of our most cherished illusion about art, that it can make us finer, more humane. Dream on, says Caravaggio. In the face of this barbaric power, all we can ever be are impotent spectators, just like those prisoners in the grim darkness, screwing their necks to get a look. It's this ruthless honesty that makes this such a modern work. Art without any vision of consolation or redemption. It's a chilling scene. For me, it's about the most powerful statement an artist 
could possibly make about the human condition, about the brutality of state murder. But it's also autobiography. Caravaggio has signed this picture, writing his name in the blood of John the Baptist. Only a guilt-stricken killer could possibly feel this desperately about wanting the violence to stop. Only Caravaggio could want so badly for the blood of the martyr to wash away his crime. Now, it would be nice, wouldn't it, if that was the end of the story? Outlaw painter redeemed by knockout masterpiece. Art changed forever, sinner saved. And in Caravaggio's case, salvation doesn't come that easily. The painter who wants violence to stop can't even control his own. Barely a month after he's been admitted to the Order of St John, Caravaggio's imprisoned for assaulting a brother knight. But, incredibly, he manages to escape from his underground cell over the castle walls and into a boat which takes him to Sicily. He returns to the safety of Naples, but it's here his enemies finally catch up with him. He's jumped, leaving an inn. His face and head slashed and gashed so badly, he's left for dead. <sighs> but he doesn't die. And in this, his darkest moment, recovering from his beating, news reaches him from Rome. The Pope's nephew, Scipione Borghese, is arranging a pardon. So, Caravaggio sets about repaying him the only way he can, the only way he's ever got anywhere. It's a self-portrait, unlike any painted before. Usually, when artists looked in the mirror, they liked what they saw. And what they saw were men, young or old, whose features were ennobled by their calling to bring virtue, beauty and grace into the world. Now, look at Caravaggio. A decapitated head. He's Goliath. A bloody grotesque. A monster. In the beheading of John the Baptist, Evil was done by other people. Here it's Caravaggio, who's the embodiment of wickedness. In this victory of virtue over evil, David is supposed to be the center of attention. But have you ever seen a less jubilant victor? On his sword is inscribed, Humilitas occidit superbium. Humility conquers pride. A battle that's been fought out inside Caravaggio's head between the two sides of the painter portrayed here. There's the devout, courageous David Caravaggio, and then there's the criminal sinner, Goliath Caravaggio. I know who I have been, says a pathetic head, unable to look us in the eyes. I know what I have done. It's a desolate vision, offered to us in utter blackness. No virtue, no grace just the dark truth from the inside of Caravaggio's head, flooded with tragic self-knowledge. For me, the power of his art is the power of truth, not least about ourselves.
For if we're ever to have a chance of redemption, it must begin with an act of recognition that in all of us, the Goliath competes with the David. In July 1610, Caravaggio rolled up his paintings and set sail from Naples, finally heading home. Sailing north, his boat stopped at the tiny harbor of Palo on the coast just west of Rome. Here, the local captain of the guard either hadn't heard about his pardon or mistook him for some other fugitive. Either way, he's thrown in jail. By the time he's managed to pay his way out, his boat has sailed off along with his paintings, his offering to Borghese. Desperate to catch up with his ship with its precious cargo, Caravaggio sets off north towards Porto Ercole, 100 kilometers through the malarial-infested swamp country, the Maremma. Here, the final disaster awaited. In a pathetic attempt to hail a ship, Caravaggio starts running along the beach under the broiling July sun before collapsing in the sand. By now, he's suffering from a raging fever and is taken to a local monastic hospital. There, according to a contemporary report, without the aid of God or man, he died as miserably as he'd lived. It's some time later that the Pope's nephew, Scipione Borghese, finally receives the paintings with which Caravaggio had hoped to win his pardon. The Cardinal finds himself face to face with the picture of the painter as the slain Goliath. The Cardinal isn't used to this. Artists have been given their gift by God to bring beauty into the world, to put mortal creatures in touch with their higher selves. That's the way. It was supposed to be, but Caravaggio never did anything the way it was supposed to be. Here I am, says this dead face, which seems still alive. They said, whoever delivers my head will get a reward. Well, I'm turning myself in. Will that do? Can I have my reward? Can I have my pardon? Sorry, says the Cardinal. So sorry. You're too late. <laughs> 